think from her. Okay. This, this computerized voice is always a little bit intimidating, so I have to repeat myself. So, um, a very warm, warm welcome to our seminar speaker today, Yannick de Raff, uh, who is coming from the University of Groningen, and uh, his affiliation is the Groningen Institute of Archaeology at the University of Groningen. Um, and uh, today uh, he will speak, his, uh, he just completed, if I'm mistaken, please correct me, uh, Yannick, dear Yannick, uh, he's just completed his PhD thesis and today, he, sorry, his master's uh, uh, course, and he will be presenting his research uh, together with Sofia Vutsaki, Theo Verlan, Gary Nobles, with uh, help from the Reality Center at the University of Groningen. Uh, the title is Death in a Digital World, and it deals with the reconstruction of a Bronze Age tomb from Aeos Facilios, Greece using virtual reality. I should also say that, uh, as I found out yesterday, Yannick is also the holder of a scholarship uh, that will deal with uh, a reconstruction of the Thorikos uh, Temple of uh, Dionysus, which will be a very interesting thing and we're very much looking forward to hear about it. And I also should say, that, as I found out yesterday, that uh, in a classical Dutch fashion, uh, Yannick uh, loves and enjoys uh, putting together vintage bikes, which also sounds very exciting. Uh, so a very, very warm, warm welcome to you. We're very much looking forward to your talk. And uh, some additional information uh, upon uh, commencing of the talk, we will mute all participants just for uh, reasons of disruption and interruption that very often happens. We are really regretting the fact that this is not a physical seminar. As you can see in the background, I have our uh, university library, which is normally the room where we hold our seminars. But due to the current pandemic situation, we cannot offer you cake and we cannot offer you coffee and we cannot meet you in person. Uh, but thankfully, digital technology facilita facilitates the seminar. Thank you very much. And welcome, uh, Yannick. Thank you very much, uh, Anna. Thank you for the, for the very light, lovely lovely introduction uh, and, and thank you very, very much for the invitation as well. I'm, I'm very flattered. Um, I hope that you cannot hear what's happening in the background because I have a Labrador sleeping more or less right behind me and she is snoring rather loudly so I, I hope it doesn't disturb. Um, anyway, the point of this uh, seminar is not so much that I give a, a detailed overview of the archaeology of uh, Bronze Age uh, Greece and Actually, I think it is far more uh, interesting for you to hear about the way that we have applied digital techniques within our humanities uh, studies. So the, the, the title is Death in a Digital World, and we are dealing with the reconstruction of a Bronze Age tomb from Aes Facilios, Greece, with uh, the use of virtual reality. So let's get straight to the point. Um, the problem that we are dealing with is relatively straightforward. We excavated a tomb that is more than 3,000 years old and stems from the Bronze Age. It, at some point in its history, the roof had collapsed. The tomb had uh, four walls, as you, can, uh, as you can see, on all sides and contained a large mass of stones, about 200 in total. We quickly surmised that these stones must have been part of the original roof construction. As you can see from the photo, it is very difficult to make any sense of. In other words, how could this hodgepodge of stones once have formed a roof? How was the tomb entered and how had the roof collapsed? Even after excavation, we couldn't quite figure it out. So to tackle these issues, we decided to use digital techniques uh, such as photogrammetry and virtual reality. While it might be interesting to, to concentrate mostly on the technical side of the, of the problem, I think it is also worth introducing the archaeological ground of it. Why do we, archaeologists, find this interesting in the first place? And why would it be interesting to know what the roof of an old tomb looks like? Well, that has everything to do with the location of this tomb in southern Greece, in, in the Peloponnese, in the region of Laconia. Um, it is located right next to a slightly later palatial complex. For about 100 years, archaeologists have been looking for the Mycenaean palace uh, of the region of Laconia. And other well-known palaces are, are known from Mycenae and Tyrians in the Argolids in the north and Pylos in Mycenae to the, to the west. 
And it was expected that Laconia must also have one, particularly because of Homeric myths, which tell us that King Menelaus and his wife Helen, who later became Helen of Troy, must have lived in a palace in Laconia. For a long time, there was no archeological trace. So scholars have been speculating uh, about other sites in the Evrotas Valley, perhaps the Menelion mansions uh, were the residence of Mycenaean kings or the eroded settlements of uh, Paleopihi and the large Tholos tomb of uh, Vafio nearby, or perhaps even Pelana further north. This discussion um, got a new impulse when a local farmer found a little clay tablet in 2008. And on this tablet were inscribed little figures, linear B. These tablets were not used for poems or prose, but rather were administrative documents uh, used for economic transactions. And they are almost exclusively connected to palatial complexes because that is where they were used. So as soon as excavation started at Ios Vasilios, it was clear the palace of Laconia was finally found. It is located on a small hill right next to and underneath this little Byzantine church of Ais Vasilios. And the settlement uh, had been divided by this large road that was cut through the hill in the 1930s. Anyway, the excavations are not yet widely published, so the, there is not that much that I can actually say uh, about it. Other people are way more suited to do so. However, some general things. We know that it was in use relatively early compared to other palaces around 1400, 1300 BC, and that it was destroyed by fire also relatively early. Uh, so far, there have been some exceptional finds that include caches of uh, swords, stone vases, libation vases, and fresco fragments. The architecture exposed so far has shown a large open court with colonnades and column bases, but no throne room yet, no megaron. Um, and this, this situation, this, archa this architectural situation is somewhat reminiscent of the early phases of the palace at Pylos. Recently, Dickinson had hint has hinted that um, the early palaces in the southern mainland may have had a rather strong connection to, the, uh, to Crete. I think it will be very exciting to read further publications on the palace excavations. So this is uh, more or less what it, uh, what it looks like. This is one of the buildings on the left. Uh, we see uh, architecture and uh, down below here we see uh, a cache of about 30 bronze swords that have been uh, uh, kind of molded together because of the fire that destroyed the building. Here's a stone vase and a, a ceramic vase in, this, in, the vase in the shape of a bull's head. Next to the palatial site was found a cemetery right next, right at the northern edge of the hill. The excavation of this cemetery was led by Professor Sophia Futsaki of the Groningen Institute of Archaeology. It was founded around 1700, 1600 BC, had its peak uh, around 1600, 1400 BCE, and the last use of the cemetery dates to about 1400 BC. This is what we call an extramural cemetery where the graves are not placed inside and amongst houses in the settlement, but rather outside in a designated place. It was also organized, and as you can see that the, the tombs have a common orientation. The graves contained few and relatively poor goods, and this contrasts to the general rise uh, in the number and wealth of grave goods that are generally uh, deposited during this period. There are quite a few single inhumations, uh, tombs for one person, and some reuse. Uh, bodies are generally placed in a position. So this is uh, more or less what it looks like. Uh, we see a bunch of uh, cyst tombs, uh, that is um, pits in the, in the ground with uh, walls that are made with uh, well, stones stacked, uh, stacked on top of each other. Uh, some are more elaborate than others. Um, we can see that uh, here in particular, uh, some of the tombs have uh, large uh, slabs on the, on the, on the, on the, on the top. 
uh, which creates an even bedding for the cover slabs that closed the tombs off. To get back to the question of why archaeologists might be interested in this tomb and its roof construction, that has to do with the fact that it was built in a period of pervasive change. Over the course of several hundred years, mainland Greek societies are transformed from kin-based egalitarian societies into competitive petty kingdoms and then into hierarchical palatial states. This transformation is something that we try to wrap our heads around. And this is particularly visible in the funerary context where much experimentation takes place. This is obviously schematic, but in terms of tomb architecture, we move from relatively simple pits and cysts to carefully constructed beehive or tholos tombs and chamber tombs. And this doesn't happen overnight. So somewhere in between experimentation with new forms, materials and techniques takes place. You could question whether building a bigger or fancier tomb is only status related, whether it is only meant to show off. Or could it have something to do with evolving ideas about the afterlife or kinship relations, gender relations, age differentiation? We know that this is a world that is opening up in which contact with the Minoans from Crete is intensified, that ideas are exchanged, adopted, maintained and resisted. In other words, Understanding the changes that take place in this relatively early cemetery, and so the tomb construction, can help us to understand uh, the evolution of a society better. And perhaps in the future, shed light on the emergence of the palatial complex 50 meters down the road. The tomb in question is the so-called tomb 21. Whereas most tombs in the cemetery are either pits or cyst tombs, tomb, dif uh, tomb 21 is different from, from these. In several ways, it is, it is slightly different. First of all, it is larger. To call it monumental would be a bit of a stretch, but it was certainly larger than the others. Secondly, it contained far more burials. Whereas other tombs contain one, two, three, four, in one case, seven inhumations, tomb 21 contained more than 25. The analysis of the skeletal remains is not yet finished, but it indicates so far that the bodies were not deposited in one go, but that new individuals were added gradually over time. So during its period of use, it was constantly revisited. As to the construction of the walls, we see that they use uh, the progressive technique, as it is called, where in the lower part they use uh, large boulders and on top of that smaller stones. And then at the very top, uh, we see the use of uh, smoothed out, water worn uh, stones from the river. Three of the uh, walls uh, were built using this progressive technique, but the south wall is built differently and it is built with these smaller river stones which are stacked into five layers and which are covered at the end with a large cover slab made of conglomerate. Archaeologists like to create typologies to group objects together according to their characteristics. So the question is, how does this tomb compare to others? It has most in common with the so-called built chamber tombs or built tombs. These are described as stone built tombs of non-circular plan with flat or exceptionally vaulted roof and designed to accept multiple burial through a lateral entrance. And then they are closed off with these, uh, usually they're closed off with the cover slabs, just like before in, in, the, in the cyst tombs. I'll quick, quickly show you some parallels to give you what it might look like. So for example, this is the, one of the, the built tombs from uh, Thorikos, which has rounded uh, edges and a lateral entrance in its long side. Eliosis also has a built chamber tomb, several actually, and here again we see a lateral entrance in the long side um, and what we also see is uh, the uh, inclination of some of the longer walls. 
at Argos was also an excavated one. And here we again see an inclination of the walls, um, but, an, uh, but an entrance in one of the short sides. So some sort of dromos or entrance way. So clearly, tomb 21 has some similarities to these tombs, but it is also different. For example, it had no cover slabs. It had no dromos, no lateral entrance through which to enter the tomb, and no wealthy finds. In general, we see that the wealth of the finds in the uh, built chamber tombs is slightly more uh, than in the regular cist tombs. So does tomb 21 fall in between two categories of tombs, the cist and the built tomb? Anyway, it seems to have been, seems to have had a, a hybrid and an experimental character to it. The questions are thus, how was the roof constructed? How did it collapse? And how was it repeatedly opened for additional burials? That should give us insights into changing burial customs and the experiments that were being conducted with tomb architecture. At the start, the objective of our um, project was not so much to find the one reconstruction, the, the, the one roof that was certainly it. Um, no, rather we told ourselves that it would be very helpful if we would be able to confidently refute a number of roof types and limit the possibilities. That would already have been really wonderful if we, if we would be capable of doing that. The method that we applied is virtual reality, which is a simulated digital environment. Why, you might ask? we could have opted to use experimental archaeology to physically stand inside the tomb after it was excavated and to try to build a roof. That, however, is ethically questionable to just stand inside a tomb. Uh, and at the same time, this would not have been possible because we no longer had access to the tomb since it was backfilled with soil. That is general practice and is done to uh, protect the architecture from further damage. Lastly, the regular documentation, that is the photographs, the videos and the drawings, was not sufficient to answer specifically these questions. So instead, we opted to rebuild the tomb digitally. The use of virtual reality offers us uh, several advantages. Firstly, we can analyze the architecture in detail from any angle after the excavation is completed from the comfort of our own home, which is particularly easy now that we are in this global crisis, whenever and wherever we want. Secondly, we can analyze the collapse in detail. The stones that had fallen into the tomb were removed during the excavation and piled up underneath an olive tree nearby. We could recognize some of the stones uh, in the excavation photographs and approximate their positions within the tomb and place them in that position within the VR environment. So that would look something like this. Lastly, and perhaps most crucially, we could restack the stones to create various roof types as if it was a life-size 3D puzzle. What we can do is experimental archaeology, but then digitally. This way, rather than uh, hypothesizing about what the most likely roof would have been, we could test reconstructions or we could test constructions. That brings us closer to, to, uh, to the past. Reconstructions are usually first created in modeling software, or computer graphics programs like Blender or Autodesk 3D Max, and then viewed using virtual reality goggles. We have turned this around. We use virtual reality to build the reconstruction. And this makes it a research tool rather than a documentation or a visualization tool. To create the VR environment, we used a 3D surface model of the tomb that was made in the second to last year of the excavation. We can see, you can see in the topmost right, in the right upper right corner that the excavation was almost finished. There was one skeleton left. 
um, and the models of the fallen stones, uh, which had been stacked on a big pile, which you can see in the top, in the down right corner. Then one of the technicians, the programmers from the Reality Center in Groningen, uploaded it into a software engine, uh, in a, into software called Unreal Engine, and then he added functionality, and then it could be accessed using VR goggles called the HTC Vive. This video, oh, this video uh, shows um, what it is like to, to have the headset on. So I'm, uh, I'm holding the controllers here and I'm moving forwards, picking up the stones using the controllers and just moving them around, placing them here, placing them there. And then you can either walk inside the tomb by yourself or you can use the, the controllers to kind of fly in like we're doing here. And as you can see, you can, you can go anywhere, you can go straight through the walls if you want to. Uh, and you can look at it from, from, from any angle, really. As to the functionality, uh, obviously we have a save and a load button so that you can save any scenario that you have built and revisit it at a later point. And then with the place stones option, you can uh, select the individual stones and move them around. These are arranged per type. Uh, there were several types, uh, such as slabs, the river stones, uh, conglomerate boulders. In the newer version of our application, uh, this menu has pictures to accompany the, the words, which makes it slightly user, more user-friendly. This screenshot uh, shows how we have managed to place back some of the stones uh, into the position in which they were found in the tomb uh, during the excavations. And our observations from the excavation photos were confirmed and strengthened. The largest, relatively flat stones had all fallen down uh, at the same angle and they were lowest inside the tomb. And th this shows that they must have fallen down first. So could the collapse of any of the proposed roof constructions uh, result in such patterning of the stones? There are several conditions that the um, roof construction had to kind of abide by, such as the roof had to be built using the collapsed stones, the ones that we had uh, found and then modeled. Also, we thought that the, the roof should be relatively easily dismantled. If you have 25 burials, then it can't be too difficult. There can't be a risk of everything collapsing either. And then the roof type, um, should the, the collapse of a particular roof type should correspond to the positioning and the orientation of the slabs that were found uh, inside, uh, inside the tomb. So we need, we need to know if, if they correspond to each other. And then lastly, uh, are there any parallels for it? Because if there are parallels, then it is more likely uh, that we have found the original roof uh, construction. So the question then is, which roof structure is the most convincing? We have set up several scenarios um, of which, firstly, uh, the slabs. Um, we see in the cis tombs and in the, the built chamber tombs that slabs are very much often, often used. Um, but of course, here we haven't found any. So it is really quite unlikely that they covered the, the, the tomb. And also, they must have been really immensely large because the, uh, the tomb was more than two meters in, in width. So they would have been extremely large, difficult to transport and to, uh, to, to gather as well. So we can cross that off our list. Secondly, we try to build a, a dome. We know, for example, that the, one of the built chamber tombs at Thorikos is built using a dome. And that later Tholos were also domed structures. However, this was also rather unlikely. Our, our construction efforts didn't um, make this any more likely than we had thought uh, at the start, because to be honest, we don't have enough stones to, to, to build it. Uh, and also there was no indication of there having been 
any um, any counterweight. So there's no archaeological indications of large amounts of soil that are that have been that would have covered it to give it the counterweight that it requires. So we could also cross this off our list. Um, then another option would have been inclining walls. Uh, perhaps the long walls would incline towards each other like this. Um, maybe the slabs, the, the small slabs that were found inside the tomb would have been used as capstones, or maybe they would have been placed diagonally on, on top of the other stones, but really um, this wasn't very likely either, and that is mostly because the stones are so very different from each other. Uh, we have so many different kinds of stones, so many different dimensions and shapes, that it is just very unlikely that that they would have um, that it would have been possible to to create a roof using using the stones that we found. So really, the most likely option uh, in the end turned out to be uh, the use of uh, timber beams. Perhaps they used beams. Uh, on top of which uh, they, uh, the, the, perhaps they used beams um, the, what, which were placed across the width of the tomb that were then covered with some of the larger slabs on top of which were placed the remainder of the stones. There are several objections that can be made. One of the, the most uh, pressing is, the, is this one, that there's no traces of wood. We, we didn't actually find any and he would um, during the excavation. But that is uh, not surprising since the uh, tomb is more than 3000 years old and the Greek climate is generally not very well suited for the preservation of wood for such a long period of time. However, parallels did exist for the use of wood in roughly contemporary tombs. For example, the shaft graves of Mycenae and the recently excavated tomb 73 at Mitri. Also, the, this roof, the one with the uh, wooden beams, is built with the collapsed stones and it could explain the positioning and the orientation of the slabs. Um, so we think that the, the beams may have snapped due to natural decay, um, starting in the southern part of the, of the tomb. They would have snapped, causing the uh, stones to kind of slide inwards First the slabs and then the remainder of the, of the stones. And lastly, um, this roof construction would have been relatively easily opened. You can simply remove the stones and the beams and climb down into the tomb. As to our archeological conclusions, um, the, we think that the roof had a timber support, uh, first of all, um, and then the tomb was continuously opened for additional burials by wholesale dismantling uh, the roof. So in its entirety. Then lastly, how did the roof uh, collapse? That was most li likely due to the snapping of the beams. This best explains the kind of patterning that we observe inside the tomb during the excavation. So architecturally, we could say that Tomb 21 is something of an, of an experiment and, it's this, uh, and it, it conforms to this, this larger, um, to, to this wider trend that we observe across the mainland in which experiments are taking place with this, uh, with this tomb architecture. It is, yeah. As to virtual reality, uh, what did it add to our project? Um, first of all, it allowed us to, to confidently refute several of the hypothesized roof constructions. They really, they're not likely. And rather than being able to only hypothesize uh, about this and to say, yeah, maybe it was like this, maybe it was like that, we could now really test it. And also it has um, helped us to better understand the collapse and the use of the tomb. Furthermore, um, we are going to use it as a teaching tool at the University of Groningen. It's being prepared um, to use it regularly within the curriculum of digital archaeology. And very recently has uh, featured in the ex exhibition called Dig It All, or Digital, at the University Museum in Groningen, which was set up, um, the exhibi exhibition was set up by some of my fellow archaeology students. 
So then as to death in a digital world, what it adds to our project is that this virtual tomb could be used as a digital laboratory. Thank you very much for your attention and uh, thank, special thanks to the organizers as well as uh, Ludmilla and the Reality Center in Groningen. Thank you very much, Janik. Uh, first of all, I will uh, just uh, stop the recording here so everyone's aware of that.